All right, welcome everyone. <laughs> welcome everyone. It's um, it's us between you and um, the closing keynote, so we'll try to be uh, we'll try to be quick. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to this session. We would like to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about uh, what it means to, to to develop modern Java applications and uh, how you can deploy those into the cloud. So just a kind of um, Thought, you know, how many of you write code? Okay, that's a good. It's a, it's a very good test. Now we know that your hands are working, but it's also kind of a nice transition to the next slide that we'll get into the second, into a sec, uh, in, get to in a second. It's it's getting late. Um, but before we do that, I think it's time to tell a few words about ourselves. So you get to start. Yeah, that's a privilege. So my name is Mats. When I'm not there. Uh, Pretending to be a rock star, being taken pictures <laughs> of a stage. Uh, I'm, I'm a Java and Kotlin developer. Uh, we, both me and Rustam, work for a Norwegian consultancy company, uh, Computas. We also have a Bucharest office, um, and that's the sale pitch. So contact us if you want to know more. But okay, so we, I, uh, at my everyday work, I write code for the Norwegian Welfare Administration, uh, mostly Kotlin, mostly backend, using some of the tools uh, and. Yeah, some of the tools we are, we're going to talk about today. And Rustam, how are you? Um, I am also working in the same company. I, both of us are based in Oslo, Norway, and we are, uh, I'm working with Java and cloud kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm also a Java champion and, and Google developer expert for cloud. And uh, well, yeah. So either I'm traveling to conferences and doing talks, or I'm working with some customers and helping them to to, to, to develop cloud native applications uh, in one way or another. All right, so back to writing code. Why I ask that uh, question? Because, you know, we do write code, but we do write code for a reason. Because, you know, you want to make a piece of code available for a certain amount of people. I mean, do not misunderstand me. It's really fun and everything to do that. But it's not just the reason. It's not just like you're writing it for fun, right? The whole idea is to make it available to someone. So call it, put it, deploy it into production, right? And uh, yeah. Yeah, and especially if you want people to pay you for doing it, you, need to, you should make your code available to someone because someone has a need that you need to solve, right? That's but hey, it works on my machine, right? Yeah, it works <laughs> on my machine. So that's the... That's where, what we're going to, to be going through today. It's like, okay, I have this business ID, this business logic, and we're going to take you all the way from that into something that's publicly available, uh, deployed, and all of that, which we'll go through in the next. So our application was uh, very simple, and that was uh, on uh, purpose. So that was purposefully kept very simple, and it was just an application that would read to a list of words and spit out two random words. It was inspired by a, a kind of two-factor or multi-factor authentication thing that we had in Norway, which would just show you two words on a phone and two words on a screen, and then you would know that the request for authentication was actually initiated by your application, not somebody else, and then you will just approve it and do stuff. and log in into different various things. Um, but the, here it just gives you two words. You can use it for that. You can use it for naming your Docker containers. I mean, you've probably seen if you, call, if you, if you create new containers, it will also create a similar kind of thing where it will just call a, an adjective and a noun to, and add it to your container if you haven't provided any names and stuff like that. And, you know, the way it looks, it's something like that. I have been doing this talk together with Mats a couple of times, and I started doing a really, really bad joke that you can use that application to name your pets. I mean, if you want to do that, call it, call that your cat or a dog or something. That's perfect. Uh, but you know, it's it's you know, what happens when you do this talk uh, sometimes. Please don't do it with your children. <laughs> well, I mean, that would be a nice name for a kid, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Don't quote me on that either. Um, all right. So, but the idea is, you do call it an API, and it gives you two words. As you can see, we did some uh, some kind of assumptions here. So you see, you have an a URL on top, and you have a, some kind of very very advanced JSON coming back, right? So the first step we start with. So our whole story will be based on taking a little piece of code 
and going all the way into production and all the way into the cloud and, and doing it more and more and more uh, fancy and advanced. So the first thing we do, we need to write logic. And the logic is this. Yeah, and here we even added a feature flag to say, like, okay, should we read the values from uh, an enum or from a file? But like, the, the last business logic of our application is summarized in these three lines. So it's really simple, like, okay, give me a, give me a noun, give me, a, give me an adjective, and do some random things and return. Mm. Of course, you will have some more, you will probably have more complex business logic in your application, but like, all the rest of the things we're going to talk you through for the rest of the talk will be, will follow the same concept and be similar. So you need some kind of logic, business logic. So here you have some kind of business logic. And we'll share the, the source code with you as well at the end. So there will be a link to GitHub repository with all the code and everything. So you'll be able to actually have a look how it works. Uh, so at this point, it's probably a good idea to ask, like, okay, what do I do? Like, what the first thing you learn at the university? How do you run that thing? How do you make it available for at least one user? Anyone? What do you do? Like, how do you make that Java? It's, it's Java code. How do you make it run? Simplest. Don't think complicated. Yes, static void main. Public static void main string args, blah, 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 right? So, you know, you made it, you run it. And then, you know, you need to, that's the first thing you can do. But then it still runs just for you, just on your machine. Uh, if you go back to what we did, we did, few, we, we did have a few assumptions. We had URLs, we had uh, JSON, we want to do all that, right? So we need to do something else. We need to do something more. And this is where, like, you could do this all by yourself, but these are typical generic problems that many engineers have been working on. Uh, problems are, like, tools that all of us developers typically need. We need well, to be able to serve JSON, to create the rest endpoint, and so on. And don't reinvent that wheel unless, unless you find, like, real reinventing fun. You can reuse Jakarta EE and MicroProfile uh, to solve these things for you, to, to provide you with the API and all that, as we'll see in a second. And this is kind of opinionated stack, right? So we had to pick something and choose something. You could do it with Spring Boot, you can do it with other things, but this is what we ended up uh, choosing. And we'll explain a little bit about the features of the thing that we chose, but you can build it the way you want. So what is this microprofile thing? I guess we should start there. Yeah, I guess we should start there. So there are many ways to tell what microprofile is. I will say the easy way to put it is that it's Jakarta EE for microservices. It's not true, but it's <laughs> a useful model. So OK, that maybe helps a lot. So how many, people, how many of you know what Jakarta EE is? I briefly know. Okay. Quite a few. That's nice. Um, Java E. Is it the same? Okay. Wait, let's same. do this. Jakarta E. Up with your hands. Uh, Java E. J two E. Yeah. Okay. So at, at the, at the, that's the thing. So you keep on saying names, and then more and more hands are raising, uh, getting raised, and at the end you have the whole room. Uh, the, question, the, the thing is, when we said Jakarta, all of you could have raised your hands already because it's been changing names and, you know, it's been called different things, but now it's called Jakarta. E. It's the same thing as J2E, Java E, and all the other E's, probably, most of them anyway. Pretty close. So, uh, but like, well, we're going, don't worry, we're going to tell you what Jakarta E is as well. And it's a set of specifications. And you can see on the slide here that there are lots of small boxes. Otavia on the front row here is a front responsible for a few of them. Jakarta Data and NovaSQL is coming in as well. I'm not sure if they're here yet, but like next time we're doing the talk, you can see him. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see that there are lots of boxes which are typical things you need. And each box is a specification. And that is important because that means that, well, uh, you can switch implementations without touching your code. We'll be coming back to that in some minutes, but that's an important part of the Jakarta EE. Like, the API is the same, and the implementations may vary. And there is a reason why all the other boxes are grayed out, and it's very hard to read, because we're not going to be talking about all of those. What we will be talking about is the core profiles, so the ones that are actually shiny and colorful and stuff. Uh, so that is where we start. So we'll need the, you know, dependency injection, you know, JSON stuff, annotations, interceptors, you know, all these kind of fun things. And then we're going to do something on top of that. So then you, uh, you see that 
all of a sudden that little yellow box at the bottom there is the Jakarta E10 core profile. So the whole thing that you saw here is now just one little yellow box at the bottom. And then we have some other things on top of it that make an application to become a good uh, cloud native application so you have things like you know a way to document and 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 like describe your APIs like open API things rest clients to talk to other rest API endpoints uh, config fault tolerance metrics uh, authentication health all those kind of things right and that's where the micro profile thing comes in yeah and micro profile is uh, as Jakarta EE it is, a, it is a set of specifications. Mm. So each of the boxes you see here is a specification. Uh, that, that's important to state first. And also, you could see that, well, as Rustam said, the Cardi has been evolving for many, many years. Um, but whereas MicroProfile is much newer, it's like 2016 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's created in an, in an age of, of microservices and in, in an age of cloud, right? Whereas the Cardi is older. So that means that MicroProfile is tailored to what what you typically need in a cloud native environment. Mm. You need things like health services, metrics, as Rustam said, all these specifications. And also it's been created in a, in a time where Java E back then, it was called still Java E or J2E, uh, it was um, kind of very passive. It was not being developed any, anymore for quite some time, and people were not really sure what's going on. So somebody got together and created MicroProfile as a kind of a continuation, and now we need to create something that will let us, to create, uh, let us create cloud-native applications as well. So now, uh, now the uh, Java E, J2E has been given to, to Eclipse Foundation together with uh, MicroProfile, so now they're under the same foundation, now they're kind of intertwining a little bit as well. So that's why we see that we have a Jakarta E part of it. Uh, before it was uh, all uh, separate, doing separate things, now they're getting more and more closer together. Um, a quick thing that it's not just a random thing, there is actually a relatively big and small uh, groups uh, behind it. Yeah, so you can see there is everything in this slide, it's like from small, uh, small, medium, small uh, Java user groups like Atlanta Drug, uh, the Garden State, New Jersey, that's the, the one in the green and black circle, and also iJug, that's the German, like association of German uh, Java user groups. Mm -hmm. and, but also you have big companies like IBM, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, some smaller ones like Fujit. Smaller, like Fujitsu, but a, a Primeton as well. Smaller, I guess. But Tommy Tribe is smaller, though. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. But that's the thing. So that's a, that's a working group. That's the people that decide how things will be uh, developed and how it will, will be working. And uh, as Matt said, it's, it's, it's a specification, so somebody needs to implement it. And there are quite a few implementations that use MicroProfile as well. So, I mean, that's all, all we're trying to say now is that it's not just a random kind of little project. It's, it's a relatively um, well-backed project with uh, quite a few implementations. And the cool thing is that if you encounter some kind of bugs or features that you don't really want to have or are lacking, you can switch to another implementation and, and see if you can get whatever you want in another one. So if you're running it on uh, one, and you want to switch to another one, it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But um, we talked a little bit about Jakarta E, we talked about MicroProfile, but where do we start? What do you want to do? Yeah, so there are several answers to this. There are like the concept of starters, I think we should start, haha, uh, start there. Like, <laughs> there is a starter for MicroProfile, it's somewhat dated, so I wouldn't recommend to use that one. There's an upcoming starter, or there is a starter for Jakarta EE. Yes. Uh, that's a bit new, so it still needs some more development before I would like go there. So what we would recommend to do uh, is for you to go to the starter for the, for the specific application server or the runtime you want. So whenever you cho you've chosen one of the implementations that we just showed you uh, on the previous slide, to say that, oh, I want to use this application server to to, uh, to power my application, and then you, then you Google, like, if you go for, for Open Liberty, you Google Open Liberty Starter, and it takes you to that yeah. web page. And you can do the same with Quarkus and Helidon, uh, or 
yeah, whatever application server you choose to go for. Actually, we should have asked how many of you have heard of MicroProfile just to begin with. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's then then we can keep on the same uh, level. It's not that many hands, so that means that we need to explain a little bit uh, a little bit more in depth. That's good. Yeah. So. Um, now we'll show you a little bit, we'll show you the code and everything, so don't worry about that. But the thing is, like now, you, at this point, you just have to trust this. So we've 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 have our logic. We added all this Jakarta E and MicroProfile stuff uh, that does all this, you know, all this magic stuff that does like open APIs and REST clients and config and fault tolerance and REST endpoints. You know, all this all this stuff is working. And now you just run it uh, and compile it and just get up the, an, an, an app, app server or a, a runtime, as they like to be called nowadays, uh, running, and it works in your machine. Now, what do we do now? Yeah, uh, we update something, obviously. Oh, we have an update. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thank you, Apple. Now, but like, you know, people asked themselves this question <laughs> uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something. Okay, it works on my machine. So like, okay, when do we do when it works on your machine? We ship your machine. Yeah. And hence can, came the concept of containers. Before it was kind of scary. Now it actually makes sense. We ship, not, well, not exactly your machine, but you build a tiny little one that you can ship around. And then you, well, so now you have a logic. You have all the code around it that you don't have to write uh, yourself. Uh, and you put it in the container. There are different ways of putting things in a container. There are dockers, there are podmans to run it, there are a rancher, there is like a bunch of other things that you can use, but the, and there is a bunch of other things that you need to think about when you put things in the containers. That could have been a separate talk in itself, but you know, think about that you need to optimize things. It's not just shoving things in a container and just saying, hey, now we have cloud native, yay. Um, you need to think about how it's built, how long it time it takes to build it. You know, think about uh, things like a multi-layer uh, builds for containers and so on, so on. So minimizing um, footprint of, of a container, uh, thinking about security of your containers. There's a lot of things to think about it. But we can talk about that later. Let's don't complicate things for now. Let's we just put it in a container and it runs magically. What do we do now? Next, we put things. Yeah. So the nice thing, thing about containers, one of the nice things about containers, right? Is that I run them on my machine. They run the same way as in your machine, and also, the, the, hence, they run the same way in the cloud. So we yes. take the container, we put it into a cloud. And actually, the thing I usually say, but I forgot to say this time, is that uh, containers is not only reproducible builds. Uh, but it's also reproducible deployments, so you can actually get both. It's not just like, I know if I build it on my machine and ship it to your machine, which has the same architecture, it works, but it's also um, reprodu reproducible deployments as well. I know that I can actually deploy it to different uh, environments and it should work uh, fine. So now we, it's time to put our little piece of logic into the cloud and, well, maybe beyond, who knows. How do we do that? Well, uh, when you develop things in the cloud, it's uh, a very, very, very wonderful. The, the first Im important things and important steps there is to um, do not do what it's very tempting. Do not do what they show you on all tutorials when you start with the cloud, and that is doing click ops. So click ops is a big no-no. Do not try to actually like, go into the interface of a web through a web console or something and try to deploy our application. Because, I mean, yes, it will work, but it will not be reproducible whatsoever. So you need to automate your builds. You need to automate your tests. You need to aut automate your uh, creation and uh, tearing down of your environments. You need to automate all kind of things. Everything that you can automate, you automate, and then you take a deep breath and you automate some more. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to do exactly what Rustam just told you not to do. So this is from the, uh, from the user interface uh, at Google Cloud Build. Do what I say, not what I do. <clears throat> exactly. No, but like for demo's sake. Uh, but, okay, so first, uh, we have chosen to use Google Cloud for this presentation. You could do the same thing with Azure, with Amazon, with IBM Cloud, I guess even with Oracle Cloud, um, or any other cloud. So, but this, we have chosen Google Cloud because we needed something, right? So here we can see what, so what we want to happen is whenever I do git commit and git push my code into the main branch, then I want the container, I, 
I want my tests to be run, I want the container to be built, I want all the checks to be done, and I want, if everything succeeds, I want my, my container to be put into uh, the test environment and into production. Right, so that's what we're trying to accomplish. And there are way, ways of building that, right? So what we chose in this case and what we're showing you on here is ClickOps version of a local uh, build solution for that particular cloud. It could be anything, it could be Jenkins, it could be something else, but the point is that you need to automate that and just trigger whenever you, for example, whenever you commit or whenever you push something to a specific branch or whatever that might be. Yeah, we might also emphasize the fact, you can see on the bottom of the screen here, you have the build configuration uh, and a set of radio boxes where you choose like, okay, I want to provide a docker file or I want to provide a glo global YAML file. Mm. So you can try with the other file, hopefully it works. If so, then you could be happy. But Google Cloud has this concept of global YAML file. It's quite, quite similar to GitHub Actions and YAML files there, or Jenkins file and Jenkins, or like most of the build tools have their own configuration format. We could say like, oh, I want, I want my code to be built on this heavy machine or uh, with this and this specific settings for the build yeah. uh, and so on. So we can configure a bit more with the YAML files. So Docker file basically will contain all the application-specific stuff, but you need to, if you need to add some more things that are more specific to the environment where you're building, you will probably need to add more stuff to it, like uh, Cloud Build YAML in this case. Um, yeah. So now that we have our code in a container in the cloud, we're done, right? Almost? No? Um, Pretty close, actually. So now we have built this container. Like, so we made sure that whenever I do git push and everything, it's, it's built and so on. So then we get a new, fresh container. And so you have the container, but it's not available for someone. You have it just lying there, so you need to run yeah, it Yeah, so that's the thing. So we need to deploy it and make it. We're still trying to make it available for everyone. And uh, well, of course, we could have done it like without all the cloud things and everything, good old way, create a VM slap on a, some kind of app server on it, deploy your jar, and just make it available for everyone. But you know, you don't really want to manage all that stuff anymore. So here we'll be talking about more how to automate that even further. So automating, speeding of automating it further is that you don't want to manage all that. And serverless doesn't mean no servers. Well, obviously, you need servers. But it means, I usually try to say it means um, manage less. So you need to manage less of your stack. And um, this is what we do. So now we have to deploy our application. And there are different ways of deploying it, in, especially, in, for example, in Google Cloud and all, all other clouds. You know, like I said, there is a VM. There is a Kubernetes cluster. So you can deploy it. You can deploy it as a, some kind of function. You can deploy it as a whatever. App Engine, uh, you name it. Uh, we want to go serverless. And with the, with the serverless, we actually mean um, a, a Cloud Run, and which is a kind of um, very similar thing to Knative. Uh, Knative is an open source um, solution that lets you run serverless applications on your own cloud or on-prem on uh, that lets you do. Uh, so it's basically. It's a layer on top of Kubernetes, on top of Istio, or some other service mesh. And on top of that, you have Knative uh, doing all the uh, job and managing the containers and making sure that uh, containers are being sp spun up or down depending on the load that you have uh, for your application. Yep. And that's kind of it. Now we should be actually available at the internet somewhere. Yep. So. Let's see. OK, so this is from an invocation. You get a breezy backup. You can see the URL there is no longer a localhost. It's random strings x2 some, qt something uh, and then a public URL, right? So now we have a cloud solution that generated us a URL. In this case, it looks, in this case, it looks like this. We could have provided a custom domain. We could have done a lot of things. But this is what we get out of the box. If you're using other cloud, you will, it will look probably a little bit different. But now is the point is that you have something that is publicly available on the interwebs uh, and just gives you a, 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 a JSON document back. Um, so serverless is kind of really nice. But there are cases where probably we shouldn't look into serverless as well. So we probably should mention a little bit about that. Yeah, I think we should. So there are, like, serverless is great for the case when you have not, 
varying number of users. Like some days you have zero users, and uh, on, say on every Wednesday you get 1,000 users, and on Thursday you have three users. So like your load varies. That's the case where the serverless is fine. Like mm. if you have a constant load of users all the time, probably won't not necessarily usable serverless. But there are also some other characteristics that are important for your application. And the first one is it should start up fast, right? Because you can scale your application down to zero, so it's not running. But whenever a user invokes something, uh, your application starts up. And then it's important that the startup time is, is short. And the other thing is, uh, as a consequence of like scaling up and down, you don't want that much shared state in your application. Yeah. So you want your application to so most of the shut down. Yeah, exactly. So most of the cases, you really want stateless applications. You can spin one or 100 of them or 300 of them, and it wouldn't matter. They will all be receiving some kind of requests from, because you, on top of that, you would typically have a load balancer that will be re uh, receiving a request or hundreds of requests from all the users, and then it will be kind of routing to all the other instances. Uh, what will happen with serverless, which you don't really have to think about, is that it will scale up or down to a number of uh, instances that you have provided based on some kind of metrics, number of users, CPU usage, memory usage, whatever that might be. And then it will kind of scale them up and down. But so if you have a heavy application that is super, super heavy and very heavy on startup, you don't want to go serverless because it will take longer for users uh, to spin up new instances. You might want to have already uh, some instances running. Uh, you don't want to have um, you don't want to have uh, applications that share have to share state. You don't have to do um, you know you, there is a lot of things that might be a problematic if you have a serverless application. So. Um, but we can, we can talk a little bit more about that in a bit. For now, we need to make it fast. Because if you think, you, like, just to think for a second what happens when you know, you're running serverless, uh, there haven't been traffic to your application for quite some time. Everything has been kind of spun down because you don't want to spend money or resources running all that. Because if you're running on the cloud, you will be paying for that. If you're running in on-prem with Knative or something, you will be paying for that in a form of resources or somebody something using up resources, right? So no application running whatsoever. Request comes in. What happens? Well, something has to wake up, has to run to the uh, container registry, pull that container down, start the container up, then application inside that container has to start up. Uh, then uh, the whatever platform is running has to actually know that everything is ready. Then it has to route the request to that thing. It has to process all that request, return it back to, uh, to the kind of external network thing, and then going back to the user. So all that is happening, and you have to make it fast. You have to make your containers smaller. You have to make your startups faster, and so on, so on, so on, right? So how do you make it fast? So, well, yeah, so we, we described that there are, there are a number of different runtimes that implement MicroProfile and Jakarta EE, right? And they have different strengths and different, different weaknesses. So one of them, uh, are like talking about speed, so there's one runtime that's like really focused on running fast in, in a cloud native uh, Kubernetes con uh, environment, uh, and that's Quarkus. So from Red Hat, originally made by Red Hat. And you can see a lot of logos here. You, you might recognize some, uh, like Apache Kafka, OpenShift, Kubernetes, uh, MicroProfile, of course, uh, and so on. So Quarkus is built on top of lots of uh, well-known, established uh, frameworks, mm. like Elias also was talking about in previous talk here. And they are really focused on, when, when they made Quarkus, they said like, OK, so you're probably going to run this runtime inside the Docker container anyway. So we are going to make the, our runtime so really tailored for that, which means that building a Docker, a Docker container or, or like a whatever container uh, with Quarkus takes longer time. But when you start it up, everything is already ready. And like the environment is set up, so it starts up really fast. Again, everything in software architecture is a trade-off. Mm. So, um, but th that's actually quite an interesting thing because we've been doing these talks uh, on MicroProfile for quite some time, different kind of talks. And uh, what we've seen is that like, most of the application 
uh, or uh, well, application service, I keep calling them, but they're now that we call them runtimes, uh, they would be very fast. All, all of the ones that we've seen earlier, you know, uh, Helidon and uh, Open Liberty and all the other ones, but they will be around roughly around the same kind of uh, around one second startup time for a very simple application. What we've seen with this one is that it would be way, way, way much faster just out of the box because, you know, it would, it, because of all the things that Matt said, it would be like, you know, if you start them inside a Docker Compose file, you will see Quarkus booting up and putting into logs like, I'm done booting, I'm ready to receive requests, even before all the other containers or all the other um, runtimes even start logging anything. So they will be like, I'm done, and then all the other ones will be like, oh, I'm waking up, I'm loading, I'm doing stuff, and it's like, oh, now, okay, I'm, I'm ready to receive requests as well. So that's one thing, right? So now you sped, you manage to speed up your startup time of your uh, application inside the container quite a bit by just simply switching to another uh, another runtime, and in this case, it's Quarkus. And well, a few words. How do you do that? Actually, switching from something to another. Yeah, and this is really cool. This is like we come back to the point where we talked about Jakarta EMA profile being, spe being specifications, right? And different runtimes implement the same specifications. And that means that if you want to switch from runtime X into Quarkus or Open Liberty or whatever, like what you have to do, you, you change your build files, you change your uh, PUM, PUM files or build Gradle if you're using Gradle, uh, you change the properties and so on, and the cloud build YAML file, like the config for the build, and then you're done. So what you don't see on this slide is the important thing. You don't see any change at all to your code. Mm -hmm. Nothing here about Java code. Uh, or Kotlin, like everything we're talking about. When we say Java, you could also say Kotlin. Uh, everything works the same way. But you don't touch that code at all, which is really cool. And that's kind of a cool thing, right? So now we have running it. So just to show you that we're running it now, switch to, to Quarkus application. Now we're running that thing uh, inside a serverless uh, offering, whatever that might be in this case, a cloud run. And we also put the Quarkus into URL. So now we know that that thing actually works. Uh, uh, running on Quarkus. How do you make it a little bit more faster? Obviously, you can add two racing car emojis that will make it definitely faster because, like, it's two is more than one racing car emoji. But, you know, we need to do something more because um, we're still having this problem of cold starts. You know, things are running serverless. We have decided that number of applications, a minimum number of applications for us is zero. We could have said one and had a little bit less of that problem, but would still would have that problem when you would scale it up. Uh, because, but to make it simpler, let's say that n minimal number of applications is zero. So no applications running, request comes in. We need to make it faster because a user does not want to wait for those hundred uh, 100 um, milliseconds or whatever that is, right? So, what do we do? Well, there is a trick. Yeah, there's a trick. Like, part of what's taking time, <laughs> see your friends. Uh, so, part of what's taking time in the startup and container is, like, is that the JVM needs to start up, right? The Java virtual machine is great, provides us with lots of things we often need, but maybe we won't need them for short living applications. Mm -hmm. So Quarkus uh, has two modes you can run it in. You can run it inside the JVM, like the normal mode, or you can run it in what they call Quarkus native. And Quarkus native is totally outside the JVM. Uh, you're like, you're when you're building your container, you're building a binary, like a native binary, which runs like that. And it runs uh, by using GraalVM. So th th what happens is that, you know, um, you will get much faster startup times, right? Because everything is now is compiled. It's just one binary. It's just one executable. There is no JVM. There is no nothing there anymore. It's just binary. 
but you do sacrifice a little bit of something, and that something is that. So what you would, what you would typically see that you will, with, the, with the JVM mode is that it will have a little bit slower startup time, but then it will kind of optimize because you know JVM does what it does. It actually does some optimizations and stuff. And at some time you will see that and, uh, the, the time it takes to, 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 to return a request will actually go down a little bit, so it will go a little bit faster, right? Uh, with GraalVM, you will get much faster startup times, but it will be linear, so it will not change, it will not do any optimizations or anything like that out of the box. Um, so, yeah, you have to think about that as well. So you'll get faster startup start times, but if you have an ap application that needs some kind of optimization and stuff like that, then um, maybe, growl, maybe you should go for JDB JVM mode after all. Yeah. I also think there's one more thing we should mention, and that when you're using native mode with GraalVM, you're trading build time for runtime. That means that building your container oh, yeah, takes longer time and is heavier, yeah. but starting up your container is really, really fast. So, and that's another thing that we've seen also that we kind of, we saw longer build, build times, and also sometimes that we needed to beef up our build servers as well a little bit add more memory to it or more, more cores to make it a little bit more uh, easier and faster to go through uh, the build process as well because, um, you know, native does a lot of things compile time. And um, so this is a kind of um, time where we have a little quick demo. Yeah. But we need to... Are you logged in? No, you're not logged in on this No, thing, right? so like so. we don't see the... We can dashboard use the, which can copy the URL. We can use the... Oh, but the URLs... Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the... Okay, so now you can see I'm pressing, right? So yes. I'm pressing now. So one, two... So we start... This is the JVM mode. Three, four... So we still need five, to be rather patient, right? This is gold start. Six. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. So six seconds, that's usually what happens. So right, okay. all so the things really I told you happened, you know, everything from a cold start, uh, it went to, to somewhere to a cloud, to a load balancer, pulled down the image, started the image, started the application, routed the request, processed, generated this random thing, returned everything back, and all that happened in six seconds. It's not really f when you think about all that that happens, it's not that bad, right? You would say, you would think. But for a user like all of us, would you wait for six seconds if you just wanted a, just a web page to show up? Uh, probably not, right? So what we can do yeah. is so we can try the other one. We can try the other one, but just for the purpose. So I do a refresh, and you can see now it's really fast. So yeah, now it's really fast. Started, so now we're happy. But like the poor first user. So maybe we forgot to mention that like one use case like motivating this talk is like I want, we wanted uh, to have a Java application as a backend for frontend. So our frontend calls the API and, mm. and also we have like a very varying number of users, right? So it shuts down for say 20 or 24 hours a day, but like we want it to be fast when we need it. So let's start the native one. Now one, press. Two, yeah. yeah. So the numbers are quite quite uh, consistent. So every time I would expect around six seconds from for the first one, and a little bit more than one second for the other one, uh, and that is quite crazy because it's the same code, same everything, uh, but the only thing we did is actually to compile it down to native and. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the things I described, you know, pulling down the containers, doing all this thing, it's still happening. So what we're actually saving time on mostly is actually the JVM start. And I don't know, maybe a little, I haven't, I do remember the size of containers, are they different? Um, maybe they're a little bit smaller. Yeah, the native ones are smaller. Yes, exactly. So you save time there as well a little bit. All right. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it, right? Yeah, correct. Like as, as you can see with the latest one here, like, okay, as a user, I wait a little bit, yes, but like for a so short period of time that I'm not distracted and heading somewhere else, I, I like, oh, it's loading, and then it's finished loading while I'm still happy, right? And just think about it, this is just the first run for the first user when it needs to spin up a new container. The reason I said that was that in the beginning I said that imagine that we're having a minimal number of uh, containers to zero, it is that, um, you know, 
it spins down to nothing, and then the first user coming in, you have to wait exact number of whatever that seconds is, and then it will spin up a new container. The same will happen every time a new instance is being spun up. So if we create some kind of rules to spin up a new container for every 100 users, every like 101st user will still have to wait because a new instance will spin up, and new instance will be called start, and then it needs to do the same thing. Um, of course, the numbers and time of this, like number of seconds you have to wait will be different because um, this is depending on your application, on your code, on your container, how much you optimize your application startup time, lazy loading, all those kind of things. You need to think about things like um, container size, minimizing the footprint of your containers memory-wise, but also from a security point of view, you don't really want to expose too much things that you don't really need to have inside a container. Um, I mentioned things like multi-layer containers, so you build, uh, for example, your application with maybe a little Gradle or something inside a container, but you do not bring all that with you, you just kind of throw away that layer and then you kind of continue with just a jar file. So you need to think about all those things and minimizing and pressing those little things into uh, as small as tiny, tiniest container as possible. And um, so all the code that you've seen is in the MicroProfile Random Strings uh, repository. So you can have a look there. And um, if you want to take a picture of the slide or whatever you want, like the way you want to find that code. And there is also a multi-stage uh, build uh, yeah. repository that you've created, right? Yeah, so like if you want to run Quark as like we have done, like with Quark as native and so on, you need to do some custom things with your build uh, Docker file. So we can find that on, on the GitHub link on my repo. It's pretty close to it. You can find in the Quarkus documentation. They have really improved that uh, for the past couple of months. But I think it's useful to see like how do I how do we actually do it in real code. Mm -hmm. And we also put some links to MicroProfile, Quarkus, Cloud Google, uh, Google Cloud, and so on. So apart from Google Cloud, I think all the tools we've been mentioned today are open source, totally free. Uh, yeah. Use and I mean, if you want to run on on prem, if you don't want to do a cloud run thing, or if you if you can't do it or any for any reason, you can go Knative. You can simply install Knative on whatever application uh, platform, whatever you're running on, and do the same thing. It's going to be a little bit different user interface, different way of setting up things, but you can expect kind of similar results. Uh, and also, so what we've shown you is to how to create a container out of a little piece of code, how to uh, deploy it to cloud, and then you know, stay on the serverless side where you don't really have to manage it. Because if you would have deployed it on Kubernetes, you would be paying much more for resources for that tiny little application running on several nodes and all this, and probably you don't need that. Um, if you would have deployed it to a, like a functions, lambdas that are out there on different cloud providers, you would not have like a full container. You would just have a tiny little piece of code. Maybe it works for you, maybe it will not work for your application. So there is a lot of things that you could have done a little bit different, but uh, we try to show you the full kind of working container, but with a very, very simple piece of code. Your code obviously will be a bit more advanced, and actually you do have uh, and very different application, but running on exactly the same architecture for more than just one or two or ten people, right? Yeah, so like I built an application based on this uh, tools we've been talking about today. Uh, it's running, been running in production for three years now. Um, well, about 100 users. So. And yeah, like it works. So like we are talking about this technology because we've used it. It works. Uh, the principles and concepts are nice. Hmm. So, and it's a bit different from the time of the way we've been developing Java. I'm like when I started working 15, 16 years ago, it was very different the way we would develop Java applications. You would not do that. You would put a, you would have a server. You would have a Tomcat. You would just deploy a jar on it. And uh, if if the problem was with the cold start, you will just like create a bash or. Uh, a script, uh, some kind of cron job or whatever that would, you know, ping that endpoint every time the server would restart. Typically, it would restart on weekends, and you would create one to to ping it on Monday. So then you have a warm startup, and everything was amazing, right? Uh, but 
we're not there anymore. We don't have all those servers. We don't have to think about all those servers. So this is, uh, this is the whole idea of uh, trying to um, talk about serverless as well. Um, this is uh, us on social media. So this is our Twitter handles. And um, the URL I have below is uh, basically a list to all social media because there is like a billion of them now because everything is going to take over for Twitter and not happening. So all the accounts are <laughs> on, on the website instead of listing them. Um, but we also will be happy to talk to you uh, about all this now as well. Yeah. So we'll be here for the rest of the conference, probably a bit afterwards as well. There are stickers uh, outside of this room Ooh. on the table. You can have it if you want. Oh, yeah. We have this as well. So this is a little bit large. It, it actually says L, but it is an American L. So it's kind of XL-ish uh, in, in European sizes. Um, anyone wants a hoodie with micro profile? It's, um, you can try asking a question. <laughs> or, or, or just come and say hi to us afterwards. But before we call it a day, any questions, any comments, anything that you want to share with everyone? Or um, you're more than welcome to do that after in, in a second. No? All right. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all for coming. We'll enjoy the rest of the conference.